Good morning. We welcome you to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Umatilla on this Sunday morning, July 26th. My name is Dan Williams. I am the Executive Presbyter and Stated Clerk of the Presbytery of Central Florida, and it's good to be with you again this morning. It's been a while since I've been to Umatilla, uh, but it's nice to be with you, albeit in this uh, different format uh, this morning. Let us begin worship as we come together before God. Hear our cry, O God, listen to our prayer. From the ends of the earth we call to you. We call as our hearts grow faint. Lead us to the rock that is higher than we are. For you have been our refuge, a strong tower against the foe. We long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Then will we ever sing your, to your name and fulfill our vows day after day. Let us worship God. Would you join with me in a time of confession? Eternal God, you love us steadfastly, but we have trouble loving in return. You call us, but we do not hear. You reveal yourself, but we do not see. You lead us toward our neighbor, but we build walls around ourselves. You hate evil and justice and alienation, but we get used to it. O oh God, forgive us and help us to see ourselves both as we are and as we might be before you. And draw us by your Spirit's tether into your forgiving, renewing, and serving grace through the mercies of Jesus Christ. And now I invite you to spend a few moments in silent confession. The good news in Christ is that God offers us life at every moment, forgiving us and inviting us to the freshness of new beginnings. Let us praise our God of grace. Amen. I would like to share two scripture lessons with you this morning. This first lesson comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Hear these familiar words. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, moreover he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. I know there is nothing better than for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken away from it. God does this so that all should stand in awe before him. And then these words of Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These two passages are quite similar in their approach to life as we experience it and reminders to us that that life is lived in God's grace. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is a familiar passage to many of us. It speaks of the rhythms of life, the times and seasons which ebb and flow through our daily lives. Its poetic beauty has inspired many. If you're my age or perhaps older, you'll remember that it even was a popular song in the 1960s. But when we look closer at these familiar words, time begins to take on the role of a tyrant. It becomes a bit oppressive. Times and seasons enter into our lives, and those times and seasons are not of our own choosing. Rather, some of those things we'd rather not experience. For instance, times of mourning, times of weeping, times where things are torn down. These things usually don't make our to-do lists, but they enter into our experience nevertheless. Perhaps you caught the frustration in the words of the teacher when he asked, what does the worker gain from his toil? What is the result of all of this busyness? I have seen the burden that God has laid on people, the teacher says. In other words, he's asking the question, what is the meaning of life when our best laid plans can be so suddenly altered by forces outside of ourselves. Of course, living today in 2020, we think of the pandemic that we are in the midst of, and it is a reminder that we are not in total control of the experiences of our lives. There are factors outside of ourselves and outside of our influence, outside of our choosing, that sometimes play tunes to which we must dance. It is in the midst of this frustration, in the midst of this challenge, that the teacher of Ecclesiastes reminds us that God has made everything fit together. God has made everything beautiful, if you would, in its own time. The problem is we lack the ability to see exactly what God is doing. We don't always see the beginning of those things which come into our lives, and we may not ever understand or perceive what their end may be. We see the middle of events, so to speak. So I oftentimes describe this as a nearsighted person looking at a large wall mural. From a distance, the individual cannot see the wall mural very closely, but when the individual gets close enough to make out distinctive parts of the mural, no longer is able to see the entire picture. We have been given a piece of eternity, a piece of godness in ourselves. The image of God lives, lives within us. 
yet still we cannot fathom what God is doing from beginning to end. God does this not to frustrate us, but God does this to lead us into his presence, that we might consider and number our days aright, that we might do good in this life, that we might find satisfaction where we can in the blessings that God bestows upon us, even in the face of life's challenges, that we might find satisfaction in all that God has gifted us with. God does this, the teacher says, so that we will revere or stand in awe before God. Romans chapter 8 takes a similar approach as Paul reflects upon life and, and how life sometimes throws us curves. We think we have sufficient perspective to analyze our life and what we are doing. To consider it in the light of verse 28 of Romans 8. That God causes everything to work together for good for those who love him. We think we have sufficient perspective to determine what is good for us. But when we think about it, we cannot know how our wants, how our desires, how these things may impact upon the lives of others, family members, neighbors, co-workers, even people unknown to us. Because, once again, we only see a small portion of the times and seasons that ebb and flow through our lives. And we're not always in a position to know what is best. As it is, it is God who determines what the good is, in Romans 8.28, not us. The good is that which is in accordance with God's will, God's purposes, God's plans. What we might not define as good, such as Ecclesiastes, times of mourning, times of weeping, times of tearing things up, God can turn ultimately for the good. When we consider the life of our Savior, things did not always go in a way which we would call good. Jesus was sent for our benefit and suffered much, ultimately suffering death on the cross. But we know that ultimately that was for our benefit and it is the resurrection that makes the difference. But in living life as we know it, Jesus knew pain. The pain and separation oftentimes separ associated with human life. And how God can turn those challenges into times of blessing, to times of good. For God loves us and will graciously give us all things, ultimately eternal life and peace through Jesus Christ. So Paul asks the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer that he perceives is that there is nothing in all of creation. No trouble, no hardship, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no danger, no sword, no power or principality or pandemic. No time or season has the ability or the power to separate us from Christ's love for us. There's no parameter that we can imagine, no experience that we can have that can separate us from God's love. When the Bible speaks of faith, hope, love, and trust, this is what it means. And it enables us in the face of the challenges of this life, of the times and seasons which ebb and flow through them, to be more than conquerors, as Paul spoke, that the struggles that we face in life cannot remove us from the rock-solid promise to which God has given us, that we will not just eke out a victory in this life. God promises for us a route. May the blessing of God be with us both this day and always as we continue to live life in his presence and see life through his eyes and be blessed and challenged as we're challenged by those times and seasons to which we respond. 
And now I invite you to spend a few moments with me in silent prayer as we remember the concerns of our hearts and minds, as we remember our needs at this time, before I lead in a moment, a time of, of shared prayer. Our God of grace, we thank you for your never-ending love in Jesus Christ, which always sustains us through every challenge. We are grateful for your guidance, for your direction. We, we thank you for the faith that you have given to us, the fellowship that we enjoy in our congregations. We are grateful for the ministry and witness of First Presbyterian Church, Umatilla for its leaders, for its session, for its outreach to its community, for its embracing the call of the Matthew 25 movement to be a vital congregation, to address structural racism, to address systemic poverty. We pray that you would guide the church as it bears forth this witness. We pray for those concerns which we carry in our hearts and minds this Lord's Day. We think of those who are struggling with issues of health or other circumstances, particularly all of those in our communities and our nation in this world that are affected by the coronavirus. For those who have recovered even more so for those who have lost loved ones. We pray that you would give wisdom to those that are seeking for answers to address this pandemic, whether it be the development of vaccines or other treatments that will help people recover more quickly and more thoroughly. We pray that you would give wisdom to all those in the medical professions and other professions that are working tirelessly to reach this goal. We pray for all those other concerns, all those other burdens that people are carrying at this time. As they deal with matters of health, uh, perhaps dealing with being on furlough or even having lost employment. Whatever the circumstance may be, we pray that your, your sense of presence and peace would be with them. And we ask for wisdom for the leaders of our uh, communities of our state of our nation as they seek ways to address not only this problem but the other things that beset us for the issues of intolerance and violence that have been rocking communities for racial injustice which should not be tolerated for other act, acts of ill will Pray that once again you would raise up peacemakers that will, will bring forth order and justice to the longings of people's hearts. Oh God, we continue to lift before you the communities in which we live. We pray for our schools and those who lead them as they consider plans for the upcoming school year. We pray that you would guide them so that everything that is done will not only promote education, but also safety within their realms. We pray again for the ministry of our church, for First Umatilla, for Central Florida Presbytery, for the witness of your people in this country and around the world, that in all things we might honor your name and share the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we join together in these prayers even as we pray together in our own places, that prayer which unites us in faith, that prayer which our Savior himself taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends in Jesus Christ, go forth into God's world in peace. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that peace which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory, both this day and forever. Amen. Thank you, and see you again sometime soon.